perhaps as a way to begin our conversation, uh, in your book you ask uh, uh, two fundamental questions. First, uh, how do we uh, preserve existing zones of peace? And second, how do we deepen and enlarge uh, zones of stable peace? And, and on these two questions, you begin by telling us that, in fact, on these issues, uh, we don't know much. We don't know much on uh, zones of, of stable peace. So why is it the case? Why it is so important? You know, I think that the, the field that you and I are part of is in some ways biased toward writing about war. And it's, it's not just scholars, it's uh, journalists, it's novelists, it's movie makers. Uh, if, if you pick up today the New York Times or the Washington Post or Le Monde or Die Zeit or any newspaper from around the world, I bet that you will find at least one and probably two stories about war. Today, probably you'll find something on Libya. Probably you'll find something on Afghanistan. Maybe you'll find something about the fighting in Syria or Yemen. And no question that if you turn on the evening news, the same will be true. Uh, it's safe to say that we will not pick up the paper tomorrow morning and see a headline that says, all quiet on the U.S.-Canadian border or all quiet on the Franco-German border. And that's because when peace breaks out, nothing happens. There's no noise, there's no blood, there are no bombs, and therefore there are no journalists. Uh, and in some ways I think it's true of scholarship as well, that we tend to be drawn to events and we don't spend enough time writing about non-events. Uh, and so I set out uh, in this book to try to fill that gap uh, because I noticed that in the case of my own country, the United States, if I get in my car in Washington and I drive about, I'm going to guess maybe 12 hours, I will hit the Canadian border. And that border runs thousands of miles. And you will find a few border guards who are checking passports, but you will not find any tanks on either side. That's a miracle, right? That is historically uh, a revolution, that you have a thousand-mile border that is undefended by both countries. The same is true in your country, Jean-Marc. You can now drive from France to Germany. You don't stop. You don't see a border guard. You don't change money. And it's on that border that hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of people have died in history. And so I sort of went out and looked at these these cases of states demilitarizing their relationship, of becoming so comfortable with each other that war becomes unthinkable. And then I started looking around for literature on how to explain this phenomenon, and I found very little. The, the main literature on this is, is uh, uh, about what's called a security community, groupings of countries that form communities in which uh, war becomes remote or war becomes unthinkable. Uh, so, but, but, you know, there are literally a handful, three, four, five books on that topic. And I set out to try to extend that literature. I've gathered as many cases in history as, as I could find, and then I narrowed them down to 20 cases of peace breaking out. The earliest case I look at is the initial confederation of three Swiss cantons in 1291. That federation was the basis for what is today a stable federation of Switzerland. Mm -hmm. I look at cases in the 1400s, the Iroquois, five tribes in upper, what is today upstate New York, that after many, many centuries of killing each other, sat around a fire in a town that still exists today called Onondaga, fashioned a great oral law and for the next 300 plus years not one Iroquois tribesman killed another tribesman in battle. And then I look at 18 other cases right up to the present day trying to answer that question. When does peace break out? When do countries succeed in escaping war? And, and so Charlie you tell us that uh, the ideal, the goal is peace but in fact the focus is on the war. Then the question is, and you are trying to answer this question is the book, uh, in the book, you know, how do we, and, and you are telling us that uh, uh, peace is not really uh, the, the, the thing on which we focus because peace is a non-event. And then the, the question is, so how do we produce this, how do we account for this non-event? 
and in, in, I think it seems to me that in, in, in your book, uh, in your latest book, you, you, you tell us that uh, a stable peace breaks out through what you call a, a, a four-phase process. You talk about reconciliation, then you talk about the practice of reciprocal, reciprocal restraint, you talk about uh, the deepening of social, societal integration between the, the partner states, and, and finally you talk about um, uh, the generation of uh, new narratives and identities. So if you, if you will, if you want, you know, let's take these uh, four uh, uh, elements uh, one after the other. Let's begin with reconciliation. F first of all, why do you think that these four elements are key for uh, stable peace to break out? Well, you know, the, the, the story that I tell in the book, which you very nicely summarized, was a story that emerged through the cases. Uh, it, peace doesn't have to uh, come through that way. You could generate other hypotheses, but that's what I found. Uh, and it doesn't occur, that story doesn't occur exactly the same in each case, but the sequence of steps that you just articulated is generally the, the story across these 20 very different cases, different time-wise, different culture, different places, parts of the world. So let me just, maybe, maybe I'll pick one case, the Anglo-American case, since it's one of the bigger cases in the book, and very briefly describe how it works. The, the initial movement toward peace always begins in a condition of strategic necessity. That is to say, the opening move is not one of altruism. The opening move is one of necessity. In the case of Britain and the United States, it occurred in 1895 and 1896 when a dispute broke out between British Guiana and Venezuela over their border, British Guiana, a, a colony, and the United States, which was feeling more and more powerful at the time, sent a message to London saying, this dispute between your colony and Venezuela is occurring in the Western Hemisphere. It's our backyard. We should have a say in how this is resolved. And the cabinet met in London and they sent back a message to Washington basically saying, get lost. Then there was talk of war in Washington, that this was an affront to American pride, that the British were violating the Monroe Doctrine, which said this should be our zone of influence. And they sent, uh, uh, the, the ambassador in Washington sent messages back to London saying, this is getting serious. The Americans are talking of war. And it's at that point that Salisbury brought into the cabinet the head of the Navy, the head of the Army, and said, can we go to war with the United States? And the answer from the Navy was, no. And why? Got a rise, why not? Because we have a rising Germany, a rising Japan, an uprising in South Africa that was soon to become the Boer War. And simply put, the British did not have the assets to go to war against the United States without grievously exposing themselves in other parts of the empire, including in Europe, the home, the core. And as a consequence of that recognition of strategic deficiency, the British decided to back down. And they sent a message to Washington that said, we've rethought your position. We think you are right. We will take this dispute to arbitration. And Balfour, ba Arthur Balfour, who was the speaker of the government in the House of Parliament, gave a public speech in which he said, we recognize the legitimacy of the Monroe Doctrine. So this was a clear message sent across the Atlantic to the United States saying, we want to change our relationship with you. It was the opening gesture of goodwill. So how do we uh, go from a strategic necessity to what is in your model, the first phase of a, of a stable peace uh, process, reconciliation? And actually, I, I have to say that it's a bit, uh, in, I mean, it's interesting that you begin the whole uh, stable peace process with the notion of reconciliation, because very often in the literature, we tend to, to see reconciliation taking place after conflict. So I, I thought it was interesting for you to begin with this notion. So how do we go from strategic necessity to reconciliation? I think that the, the word that I use in the book is not reconciliation. You're right that that come, comes later. It is accommodation. 
Accommodation. Okay. Accommodation. The initial act of accommodation by Britain is what sent the signal of benign intent. Okay. And in other cases, that signal is sent through other kinds of gestures, giving up territory, ending a dispute, moving your troops away from the border, settling a trade dispute. But so in the, all the cases, the key is a signal of benign intent is sent by an act of strategic accommodation, by an act so, of strategic restraint. So the, the, the first step is not reconciliation, it is accommodation signaling exactly. benign intent. Exactly. Okay. And then if that signal is correctly received and the party that receives it is interested in making peace, it reciprocates. And that's stage two, reciprocal mm -hmm. restraint, in which the party that was accommodated then becomes the party that accommodates, mm -hmm. sending its own signal of benign intent to its adversary. So in the case of the United States, it accepted the finding of the arbitration panel that found in favor of Britain. And then the U.S. went on to settle a host of other disputes with the British in a, in a uh, restrained and accommodating way over fishing rights in the Bering Sea, over the border between Alaska and Canada, over whether the U.S. could build and fortify the Panama Canal. So from roughly 1896 to 1898, the two sides engaged in a ping pong game in which they were trying to resolve mutual disputes and give ground to each other. And that's what opens the door to reconciliation. And so, so be, beyond the initial dispute, so there was a widening of, uh, of uh, trying to find common ground. Yes, you might think of about, about it as a widening of the circle. Mm -hmm. The first stage, you put your toe in the water. You send up a smoke signal that says, I'd like to give a try to reconciliation. And then the second stage, you're feeling out the other party. You're engaging in a tit-for-tat strategy of restraint. The third stage, the, the story moves from the realm of high politics, of signaling and diplomacy, to the realm of societal engagement. Mm -hmm. Stages one and two are often, are often done outside the eye of the public because they're dangerous politically. When a mm -hmm. leader reaches out to the enemy, he or she takes a risk. So behind so the scene. Behind the scene. What happens after the, after the stage is set through diplomacy is leaders start going public. They start saying, we are making peace with our adversary. And you begin to see traders, investors, tourists, novelists, public action committees start to get engaged in the game. So in the case of Britain and the United States, you see the founding and the, and the growth of the, the Anglo-American Chamber of Commerce and it meets regularly in, in, in New York and in London. And when they begin dinner, they sing the Star Spangled Banner and God Save the Queen. And behind the front table, they hang the American flag and the British flag. And you begin to see that kind of symbolism trickle down into the arts, into the newspapers, uh, and there's a, a kind of outpouring of, 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 of social engagement, a societal foundation for rapprochement. Mm -hmm. And then the final stage, which is really, which locks in the breaking out of peace, is a change in, in narrative and identity. So in the case of Britain and the United States, you begin to see Americans and, and Brits talk about one another as friends, as kin, as cousins, as Anglo-Saxon members of the of, of members of the Anglo-Saxon family, and by 1902, 1903, President Roosevelt is saying publicly, war between the U.S. and Britain would be a civil war; it would be fratricide. And British officials and British opinion writers are saying exactly the same thing on the other side of the Atlantic, and it's that sense that the other becomes the self that there is a shared identity between Britain and the United States that really closes the deal and enables the, the Brits and the, and the Americans to see each other as friends. And by 1903, 04, 05, literally, the British 
Admiralty is no longer planning for war against America. Britain withdraws its last contingent of troops from the Canadian border, and the United States stops worrying about war with the United Kingdom at roughly the same time. So 1895, the process starts. I think by 1906, you could argue Britain and America had become uh, 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 members of a zone of stable peace. So it took 30 years for the U.S. and, and the U.K. to come together. And so this... 10, 10, 10, 18, 10 years. 95. Oh, 10 years. So it was quite yeah. fast. Quite fast, yes. Yeah. Um, so it, it's really f through this four-phase uh, process of accommodation, uh, recipro reciprocal restraint, uh, societal integration, and then... Uh, new narratives and identities that, in fact, uh, uh, stable peace uh, uh, breaks out. You, you gave us the example of uh, the UK, I mean, the, uh, the US and the UK. Can you give us, and, and it's a story that we, we tend to know quite a bit, can you give us another example uh, which perhaps is less uh, well known and which perhaps uh, was more complicated and which took longer? Well, <clears throat> sure, I'll give you a uh uh, another example, and, and, and let me preface this by saying that the arrow points in both ways. That is to say, that it just it, the, the process doesn't always run accommodation, restraint, integration, narrative change. It can also go backwards. How so? In other words, peace can unravel. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no, <laughs> there's nothing unidirectional about yeah. this process. It's fragile. It's tentative and it's contingent. It's important and, to and it, it has, uh, And therefore, it has to be constantly nurtured. Yes. Yeah. And if it's, if it's left to its own devices, if it loses its forward momentum, it can come apart. Okay, so it, it has to be looked after on a, on a constant basis. Yes. Yeah. A, until it reaches a certain point of no return, and then it becomes relatively stable. Okay. But often okay. that point of no return takes quite a long time. I mean... In the case of, of the United States, the U.S. began life as a zone of peace in 1789. That's when our Constitution was ratified. And we enjoyed seven prosperous years as a zone of stable peace, only to fall apart in 1860s. So, and so, have so, over yeah, yeah, yeah. so Charlie, so your model uh, applies to uh, relations among states, but it also can be used to understand how a state comes into being. Or yes, a nation because, comes into being. Yes, because oftentimes nations emerge as the consequence of a, uh, a merger of previously separate units. Yes. Like mm -hmm. the United States, like Germany today, uh, like the United Arab Emirates, one of the cases that I look at in the book. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to give you a, a, an example of a case that took much longer, the, I'll look at the, at the Swiss Right, where you had that initial confederation in 1291, but it really wasn't until 1847 that Switzerland cohered as a zone of peace. And that's because from 1291 to 1847, that effort to, to form a stable union was deeply divided along socioeconomic and religious lines. The, the, the urban cantons became primarily Protestant, the rural cantons were primarily Catholic, and that fault line between Catholicism and Protestantism, between farmers and merchants and the middle class, prevented the, the effort to form a zone of stable peace for many, many, many decades. In fact, there were five civil wars between 1291 and 1847 that stood in the way. And then finally, whence those cleavages become uh, overcome, you see the Swiss Confederation cohere. So that's, uh, that's the, the, the four-phase process, which I think is at the beginning of your book. And then uh, in the book, uh, you know, how you know, do we have uh, enemies becoming friends? You, you argue that uh, uh, the, the, what you call the causal conditions that enable enemies to become friends uh, have to do with what you call three elements. I mean, uh, institutionalized restraint, uh, compatible social orders, and a cultural commonality. So can you tell us about each of these uh, three elements? How does it work? Well, as we were talking about just a few minutes ago, the first and second stages of rapprochement depend heavily on restraint. Mm 
on the readiness of the parties in question to kind of step back, to put one hand behind their back and say, I don't mean you harm. And so the state <clears throat> has to be capable of practicing restraint. And some states are better at practicing restraint than others, such as those that have constitutions that uh, are in their nature, polities that, 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 that uh, put constraints on their own power. But I found, quite interestingly, that all different kinds of polities, not just constitutional mon uh, uh, states or constitutional monarchies, are able to practice restraint. Uh, and this leads to one of, the, one of the important conclusions of the book, and that is that regime type is not a good predictor of when and where peace breaks out. The ability to practice strategic restraint is an important predictor. But I found that autocracies, military regimes, absolute monarchies are good uh, under some circumstances at practicing restraint and therefore should be considered to be potential partners in peace uh, and, and therefore that we shouldn't look so heavily at, at regimes. And, and we'll go back to this issue uh, a little bit later when we'll talk about uh, peace and, and democracy. So yeah. uh, uh, a given regime is not necessarily a good predictor for, for restraint. So what would be a better predictor? Well, uh, the one is, is simply the readiness of the parties in question to practice restraint. Mm -hmm. And I, in my book, do not generate or offer a theory about when that happens, except to say that it, can, it takes place under conditions of, of necessity, Tra not no, What you call strategic necessity and so on. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then the other two conditions are, first of all, compatible social orders. And that's because as polities begin to integrate with each other, if they depend upon very different social and political orders, they clash. And elites in one party are undermined by the process of rapprochement and they stop it from continuing. Mm -hmm. So in the case of, let's say, Syria and Egypt that tried to forge the United Arab Republic in 1958, that collapsed after a few short years because Nasser tried to nationalize the Syrian economy and therefore undermined and provoked resistance from the bazaar merchants and the landed gentry who then pushed the military to secede from the Union. Mm -hmm. In the case of the United States, we fell apart in 1861 because of a fundamental social incompatibility between the North, which was industrialized in a wage economy, and the South, which was agrarian in a slave-based economy. Other uh, uh, no, no, go, go, ahead. go ahead. No, no, just a, a sub-question, if you will. When you talk about compatibility, required compatibility of social orders, this required compatibility of social orders, I mean, do we need it uh, simply at the top, you know, among elites, or is it something which has to be deeper throughout the whole uh, society? It, it, is a, it is a deeper question. It is industrialized societies versus agrarian, aristocratic versus uh, egalitarian. In other words, the, you have to have structures of, pol of politics and structures of economics that don't undermine one another, because otherwise you get interest groups emerging to block the process of reconciliation. Exactly what happened, for example, in the union between Senegal and Gambia. Senegal wanted to create a customs union with Gambia that threatened the main source of income among Gambians, which was a re-export trade, because they had low tariffs. And the Gambian elite essentially resisted this, and eventually the union atrophied. So, so, uh, so Charlie, in your research, you haven't encountered examples uh, uh, telling you that it's possible to really have two entities coming together, despite the fact that there is quite a high level of, of incompatibility in terms of social order. Well, I want to stress that I'm, I'm focusing only on a very high level of integration, yeah, okay. right? Stable peace, mm -hmm. the demilitarization of the relationship. You can get very far down the road of rapprochement without having this deeper social compatibility. But in terms of, the, of locking in that more durable kind of peace, I did find that this is an important variable. Mm -hmm. Since you... you in 
since you insisted on the on the specificity of your definition of stable peace, maybe it would be useful for the audience for you to 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 to, to uh, uh, specify exactly what you mean by stable stable peace compared to peace in general, because you seem to be quite uh, specific on this uh, definition on this notion. Yeah, I mean there are many kinds of of peace out in the world, in the sense that uh, you could say that. Uh, the Cold War was really a stable peace because the United States and the Soviet Union never went to war with each other. You could say that Brazil and Argentina enjoyed peace for a long time, many centuries, because the last time they fought a war was, I think, in the 1820s. I'm not looking at not war. I'm not looking at just the absence of conflict. I'm looking at a relationship that becomes so deep that war is removed as a legitimate tool of statecraft. It's that unthinkable. Unthinkable. The countries no longer militarize their borders or have war plans against each other. So it's important to stress that that is a very high bar. Right? You can get mm -hmm. types of peace in the world that even if they fall short of that very deep kind of peace are nonetheless very important and we should pursue them. In this particular book, I look on one particularly evolved kind of peace, and that is this deeper form of the demilitarization of the relationship. Evolved and very advanced. Very advanced and rare. Yeah, and rare, yes. And, and, and then the first, the, the third causal condition for, for stable peace is what you call uh, cultural commonality, uh, which once again is, is uh, really quite demanding. Yes, I mean, it, it, culture is a notoriously elusive variable concept, uh, and, uh, and it changes over time. What is today's cultural other is tomorrow's cultural self. Uh, so let me, I just want to preface, uh, uh, preface this discussion with that kind of caveat. But I, I did find that cultural linkages, and by culture I'm referring to race, ethnicity, religion, do, uh, do matter, and they do make it easier for countries to find their way to stable peace. So, for example, Britain attempted rapprochement with Japan at the same time as it did with the United States. It worked with the United States and not with Japan, in part because of the, uh, the distrust, the racial distrust that existed between Britain and uh, and Japan that, that wasn't there between Britain and the United States. If we look at ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, that has helped secure peace in Southeast Asia since 67. <clears throat> Australia and New Zealand are not members. Why not? Because they are populated mainly by immigrants from Europe, not by Asians. And in that sense, it is, uh, ASEAN has defined itself it, to some extent uh, as a racial organization. I am not making an argument that is Huntingtonian. That is to mm -hmm. say that, that uh, countries or groups of countries that uh, are of different culture are destined to clash. I don't believe that. What I am arguing is that countries that share some type of cultural commonality find it easier to get to stable peace than countries that do not. Which leads me to another question, uh, Charlie. I mean, clearly, you know, at the very core of your book is the, the notion of trust and how do we generate trust so that we're going to have uh, stable peace being at the same time expressed and engineered. And of course, trust seems to be more complicated to achieve when there is a gap between the self and the other because of lack of uh, compatible social order, lack of cultural commonality and so on. So how do you go about precisely uh, bridging this gap between the self and the other when uh, these uh, causal conditions that you mentioned regarding compatible social orders, control community, and so on, don't exist. How do you go about establishing peace when the, 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 the gap between the self and the other is, is quite deep? Well, I think that the, the story that I tell, the sequence that we were just discussing, would apply across cases, in cases where you don't have social compatibility or cultural commonality, but one would, I think, be wise to lower the expectations about how quickly and how far the rapprochement will go. Mm -hmm. So let's say you take the example today of, of the United States and Iran. Mm 
mm-hmm. where you don't have a, a cultural commonality and you have a, a strong sense of self and other. I still believe that in the case of Iran and the United States, accommodation, reciprocal restraint, societal integration would be in very important components of rapprochement between the United States and Iran. You might not get to a stable peace in which war becomes unthinkable, but you might be able to move away from the hardened sense of conflict that you have today. So I think the model applies across time and space, but it is harder to pull off this game when there is greater distance socially and culturally. Mm-hmm. Well, and then the question, I guess, here is, you know, how far can we go based uh, on, on strategic necessity? And we can revisit the issue when we talk about the U.S. and China towards the end of our conversation. Um, and now perhaps digging, digging deeper, I mean, uh, so to speak, in your argument, you also put forward the idea that zones of, of stable peace uh, uh, can take three different forms. You talk about rapprochement. You already mentioned rapprochement in the context of the U.S.-U.K. relationship. You talk about security community and union. So tell us a bit about uh, each of these uh, different forms. Well, I, I, I went out and I, I found, as I said, lots of different cases where borders have become demilitarized and war plans have been torn up. And I ended up seeing that there were kind of three different forms that these zones of peace took. One was, was rapprochement, where the, the countries in question are no longer rivals, but they, but they sort of become, uh, they enjoy peaceful coexistence. So Britain and the United States before World War I, they were not in a special relationship. They were not in an alliance that looks like it does today, but they stopped competing with each other. So that's an example of rapprochement. Mm -hmm. The security communion is a more evolved form of stable peace. It involves not just the winding down of rivalry, but the building up of community, of rules for how the states will interact uh, with each other even though they remain sovereign and they practice their own foreign policies with regard to third parties. And then a union is the most highly evolved form of stable peace and therefore the most difficult to get to. And that is when a security community gets so close that the borders among the separate states disappear and merge into a a new sovereign state in which the separate states no longer have their sovereign rights and identity and no longer practice their own foreign policies with third parties. So a a new country? A new country. So the European Union, so is it a a security community or is it a a, a union? I would say that the the EU is is stuck right now in between. In between. In between a security community and a union and worryingly sliding backwards. That Mm -hmm. is to say, until five, six years ago, I would have said there is continual forward momentum toward union. It it won't probably uh, become a federal union like the United States, but it's deepening its collective character. That is not true anymore. Why is it that it's not? Why are we, we, you know, going backward? I think that there are uh, several different forces at play. One of them is globalization which is making uh, uh, individuals more uncomfortable, causing economic dislocation, yet at the same time making it more difficult for states to address those problems. So there is a gap between the governed and the governments and increasing voter disaffection. Immigration is certainly part of the problem, where dominant populations in Europe are uncomfortable with open borders. We have seen as a result of the crisis in North Africa that border guards have actually returned to the border between Italy and France. The Schengen Agreement that was in some ways the symbol and the the codification of borders becoming irrelevant is is going away. Borders are coming back to life. Uh, And and I think that there is a, a, a worrisome trend in Europe today of politics drifting back down from the supranational level to the national level in a way that if left unaddressed 
could threaten the integrity of the European project. What would be the solution to this situation? Because you are right, it seems that we are witnessing what we call the, the, the renationalization of European politics. So what would be a, a solution for, for this problem? <coughs> well, I mean, I, you first, know, of all, f f first of all, I mean, you see it as a problem. So if you see it as a problem, what would be the solution? Um, I, you know, I, I wish I had some magic bullet that I could offer because I do worry that uh, Europe is in, in very precarious shape today. The kinds of things that I think we need are, number one, a return to economic growth because the economic difficulties that are uh, uh, affecting Europe and the United States are contributing to the populism, are contributing to the disaffection, and that's cutting at European integration. Second, and not unrelated, there is a stunning rat lack of leadership today in Europe. Uh, no European leader is making it his or her business to breathe new life into Europe. And in some ways, I think what's happened is that Europe thrived over the last six decades by being an elite project. Now, Europe has been politicized. People in Germany are talking about the EU in the cafes and the beer gardens, but they're not talking about it in nice terms. They're talking about it in negative terms. And no politician is fighting that. Politicians are being guided by public opinion, not guiding public opinion. And I would say that the, you know, the most serious case of that is Germany, mm -hmm. where Merkel has been quite weak over the past year. She is not providing leadership uh, in Germany or in Europe. Uh, and if Germany is not present to help guide Europe, then, uh, then certainly I think the question is who else is there? And right now the answer is no one. And then a third, <clears throat> a third uh, thought would be that I think Europe needs a new narrative. Remember we talked a little bit uh, earlier about the importance of narratives and identities. I think that the traditional European nar narrative is, is we need Europe to escape the past. Mm -hmm. That resonates with older Europeans but not younger Europeans who have come of age after the fall of the Berlin Wall. They don't know World War II, the Cold War, a divided Europe. And I think for younger generations you need a new narrative about Europe's place in the world, about what Europe's responsibilities are in the 21st century and use that kind of narrative to try to build new momentum toward a collective Europe. So your, your recommendations and your assessment of, your, of the situation leads me to, to, to more questions. I mean, you talked about economic growth. I know that you're not an economist, but I also know that you're very much interested in this issue. So, you know, and, and clearly, yes, it's a very difficult situation in Europe when it comes to economic growth. So what would be your recommendation for, for you know, having economic growth happening in the European context? as a non-economist person, but interested in, in these issues? I know that it's a tough question. We're all um, looking for the answer. You know, I, I think that the, there isn't a, a single answer to that question because different economies in the EU are in very different sh uh, shape. Mm -hmm. uh, the German economy is actually doing quite well and enjoying reasonably good growth. Uh, some of the smaller economies, the Greek in particular, uh, are in terrible shape. So I, I don't think that there is, uh, uh, you know, there, there is no shoe that fits all. The kinds of, of issues that I think are important are, number one, to stabilize the Eurozone. And I think that uh, Merkel, along with other EU leaders, need to do what's necessary to prevent the market from continuing to second guess the Greeks in particular, but also some of Europe's weaker economies. Because if that continues and the EU is faced with continuing bailouts and continuing uncertainty about the health of the Eurozone, I think the, uh, the, the financial instability could spread not just within the EU, but from the EU beyond. And if uh, Greece does default, which is a real possibility, then I think you could see the French banks, the German banks, and others threatened, and that that could, again, spill over into other parts of the global economy, including the United States. So one is 
is get financial stability. And secondly, I think that the United States and Europe together need more strategic economic planning. That we, you know, we tend to shy away from the, from the, the, the idea of economic planning, but I think we need to do more on infrastructure, on job creation, on figuring out how to make our pension systems and our, our, our uh, health care systems fiscally solvent. And that's going to require more government and more policy, not less. And what about uh, a stronger economic partnership between the U.S. And, and, and European countries? Does it make sense or not? I think that that partnership is already quite strong <laughs> and that there are are some gains to be had by further liberalization, but I think the main agenda right now has to be Europe and the United States getting their own individual houses in order, uh, and that is really the recipe for uh, stabilizing the transatlantic community, but also the, the broader global economy. And part of that means a rebalancing, where countries like Germany and China export less and consume more, which would enable countries like the United States to decrease its consumption and export more. Mm -hmm. Now, what about political leadership? You said that uh, there is a need for having uh, political leaders in Europe being engaged more uh, in really uh, driving the car, if you will, and, 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 and you, you, you pinpointed that Germany in this context has a very important role to play. So uh, when it comes to the need for greater political leadership in, in Europe, I mean, uh, do we have to put all our eggs in the German basket or is there another scenario possible? No, I mean, I, I think that Germany is a, a key player and that it's hard to imagine a path out of the current crisis in Europe without Germany if not leading the way, leading with the help of others. And that's simply because Germany is too powerful, its economy is too big, others cannot fill Germany's shoes. That having been said, I think there's no question that Britain, that uh, other uh, countries in the EU need to play uh, a, a leading role, and that European leaders themselves uh, need to be to be more engaged. I mean, we, we now have a president of Europe. We now have a so-called high representative for foreign policy, essentially a foreign minister. But they're really not out there as figures of, of a broader Europe. And that's in part because national leaders don't want them to be. But I, I do think that, uh, that there, there does need to be, in, a, in an urgent way, a push to get Europe's leaders away from being so beholden and so mired in domestic politics and return to the European stage. So European institutions themselves have, have a role to play and in fact in the past they have played such a role. So why is it that uh, it seems that today compared to you know, Germany and, and, and perhaps France, uh, European institutions seem so, so weak or not really able to provide the kind of leadership uh, that is required at the European level itself? Well, I think that, that we are seeing a, a greater and greater gap emerge between Europe's institutions and Europe's politics. Europe's institutions are getting stronger and more collective. The Lisbon Treaty really put Europe up on the next rung, giving it the ability to function as a more capable union. But just at the time that Lisbon was coming into being, the EU has been politicized nationally, and the politics is anti-EU. It's populist. It's anti-immigrant. So you now have these institutions out there that are getting more and more divorced from the, the politics, what I would call the European street. And somebody has to come along and put the politics and the institutions back together again. Otherwise, I really do worry that you could have these institutions out there that come crashing down because they lack popular legitimacy and popular support. So realigning or better dovetailing uh, European institutions which uh, on the one hand are getting stronger and yet are quite weak partly because they are disconnected from European politics. So the key is to reconnect uh, politics and institutions at European level, right? And I guess that part of, of this is uh, why you feel that the, the, the there is a need for, uh, there is a need for, for a new narrative. Mm -hmm. 
yes, and, and, and that new narrative has to be part of a, uh, a kind of rebirth of democratic politics. I mean, these are things that you have written about, Jean-Marc, the mm. sort of the reconnection of democracy, legitimacy, and the European project. Uh, mm. That is, is not an impossible task. Nobody is doing it right now. Right? It, b politics is being left to its own devices, left to its lowest common denominator, and I, and I think that that's making Europe more and more fragile and vulnerable by the day, by the hour. So you worry, but uh, ultimately, do you think that you will end up being optimistic about uh, this whole situation? Do you think that you know, we're going to be able to find a solution? I, I remain guardedly optimistic. It's, I think it's hard to be a Euro optimist in 2011. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm someone who has, who has always been a Euro optimist, but uh, at this point in time, I, I worry. And so I make these statements and have written uh, uh, on this subject not as a death knell for the European Union, but as a wake-up call, as an effort to say to Europeans, wake up, look around. This project that has been so successful, that has turned Europe into a zone of peace, perhaps one of the greatest geopolitical experiments in, in engi uh, or experiments in geopolitical engineering in history is very fragile. Be careful. And, and then just to go back to the, to the book, I mean, you know, in the midst of your analysis about the stable peace, you, you, you put forward a number of uh, striking propositions uh, and, uh, and, and on which I want you to elaborate a bit. And one of the uh, uh, striking propositions which I found in your book is the fact that uh, You say that spreading democracy doesn't amount to spreading peace. And of course, it goes against uh, standard wisdom. So tell us, about, tell us a bit about this. Well, as I mentioned earlier in the conversation, I went into the project thinking that I would find that democracies are particularly good at making peace, non-democracies particularly bad, and that's because what we're taught. Yeah. We're taught it in university, we're taught it in high school, and we're taught it from our leaders. Right? Our leaders get up uh, on a regular basis and give speeches where they say democracies are wonderful and non-democracies are horrible and we must change them. Well, I found no basis to support that stark distinction. I found that democracies make peace with democracies, democracies with autocracies, autocracies with other autocracies, and that regimes that are quite nasty at home can be quite reliable peacemakers abroad. Brazil and Argentina embarked down the path to peace when they were both ruled by military juntas. Suharto, General Suharto, who was really one of the most brutal dictators of the 20th century, was also a great peacemaker. He's the one who backed away from confrontation with Malaysia and put Malaysia and Indonesia on the course to anchor ASEAN. And uh, I can give you many other cases, Mao uh, and Khrushchev. It was short-lived but they formed a zone of stable peace between a communist and autocratic Soviet Union and a relatively totalitarian China in the 1950s. So the message here is don't overrate democracy. Don't believe that you need to uh, stay away from uh, non-democracies because they're, uh, they're intrinsically aggressive. But what is the policy implication of this message? The policy implication is that, let's say, in the case of the United States, we should be choosing enemies and friends on the basis of other countries' foreign policies, not on the basis of their domestic institutions. Mm -hmm. And I think that actually the Obama administration has been acting on that. Its policy of engagement is basically to say, we will talk to enemies, and most of those enemies are, are non-democracies. The United States might not like how China treats its political prisoners. The United States does not like that democracy in Russia has been backsliding, but it has been quite pragmatic in saying to the Russians, okay, we don't like how you govern, but the agenda between us is too important to, to, to not work together on nuclear right arms control, on Iran, on Afghanistan, on the Middle East. Uh, and there I think you see a good example of a country that's not a democracy working cooperatively with a country that is. So spreading democracy, a regime change, shouldn't be, shouldn't, shouldn't be part of a foreign policy agenda? Or I they? think that the U.S. 
and the Europeans should continue to try to support the spread of democracy. But it needs to be only one component of foreign policy, and it needs to be done very carefully. And it should not be the foundation for choosing enemies and friends in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, a second striking proposition that you put forward in your book uh, has to do with the fact that you argue that uh, uh, commercial linkages uh, do not uh, necessarily promote peace. And once again, this, go this goes against what we are being taught and told. Yes, I mean, again, I, I was surprised, but I, in the 20 cases that I looked at, only in one case did commercial integration help clear the way for political reconciliation, <clears throat> and that was in Germany between 1815 and 1871, when the customs union and commercial integration among the different German states helped get Germany toward unification. In all the other cases that I looked at, commercial integration mattered only after the diplomats and the politicians had done their work, only after they had settled the key diplomatic and geopolitical issues on the table were the traders and the investors able to come in and help seal the deal. And so the, the, the policy finding that comes out of it is we can give money to Palestinians and Israelis, Bosnian serves Bosnian Muslims, get Japan to invest in China. But unless the core geopolitical issues are addressed and solved, those investments will not pay off geopolitically. The causal chain is politics and diplomacy first, commercial integration follows. So, uh, we, you know, uh, which leads me to, 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 to ask you about the China-U.S. relationship because, you know, clearly it's, uh, it's something that uh, a lot of people are thinking about. So what would be your, 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 your analysis of this relationship and what would be your, your recommendations to have uh, the, the relationship becoming more stable, more peaceful? Well, I think we're in an in a act one of a play that's at least got three or four acts in the relationship between the United States and a rising China. And that relationship is going to be one of the defining relationships of the next 30 or 40 years. For the How world. That, for the world. For the world. Yes, mm -hmm. for the world. Uh, and it, and it, it does fall into the category of a historic hegemonic transition in which you have one global hegemon that is going to be challenged by the rise of a country that by the middle of the next decade will best it economically and that over time will have the military capability to challenge the United States for hegemony, at least in its own neighborhood. Not unlike the way the United States challenged Britain in its own neighborhood at the end of the 19th century. But I would say at this point the key is to, uh, is to avoid mutual provocations, to find ways where China and the United States can work together in a concrete way as a, as a way to build trust, as a way of deepening the dialogue and the modalities of cooperation between the two so that when we get to the point where China is at a stage where it can challenge the United States, China and the U.S. are not core geopolitical rivals. Because it, I think if we, if we don't provide a foundation for that trust, then by 2025 we could see the kind of tension over naval supremacy in the East China Sea, over what's called the first island chain, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, the Philippines, that could be the main locus of geopolitical uncertainty and rivalry over the next several decades. Do you feel that in Washington people who are in positions of power are, are eager, willing, able to understand uh, China in terms of uh, its rise and, uh, and uh, how it could transform its economic power into political power down the road? I think that Washington is well aware of this. The United States is coming off of two decades in which it has been almost exclusively focused on the Middle East because of 9-11, the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, now the Arab Spring. And it is trying desperately to free up the intellectual, the political capital to focus more on East Asia. I think the Obama administration has begun to do that, but it's hard 
because the Middle East is still a black hole, sucking mm-hmm. in so much attention and, and political and military effort. But there's no question that that uh, the rise of China is on the minds of just about every foreign policy thinker in the United States. But uh, I would say that there is no consensus on this big question of how to get from here to there peacefully. So China is on the mind of people uh, in Washington, but do they have the right mind to, to address uh, China? Because I, I know that you uh, often say that uh, people in Washington tend to, to be in a bubble and they don't really uh, see the world uh, in a very open fashion. Well, you know, I think that there are many different opinions on China and that anyone who makes a, a sort of firm, definitive judgment about the rise of China today is wrong because any definitive judgment is premature. So anyone who says that China will inevitably emerge as an aggressor, that's premature because we don't know. Anyone who says that China will follow a peaceful path to greater power is wrong because we don't know. China is simply at that interim stage. The one thing that I think I would say with 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 uh, a certain amount of conviction is that China and the United States need to avoid things that will push them down an unintended consequence of rivalry. And I think the key lesson there is from World War I, where neither Wilhelmine Germany nor Britain wanted war, but they got locked in a naval rivalry and in a broader geopolitical rivalry which led both of them down this path that ended in war. Mm -hmm. And I think China and the United States need to be very careful not to get involved in that kind of tit-for-tat struggle in which neither wants conflict, but they end up sliding down that slippery slope. So precisely how do we think and how do we shape and and, and envision policy, foreign policy, uh, in a context which is so uncertain, keeping in mind that we want to avoid you know, this kind of slope that you just uh, referred to? Well, I think it, that the, the key, and this goes back to accommodation and reciprocal restraint, is for the United States to put its cards on the table, make clear to China what its red lines are, but at the same time make clear that it does not mean ill to China, mm-hmm. that it is not attempting to block China's rise, that it in fact believes that China's rise can be good for the world as long as China plays by a certain set of rules. I think the key here is to nurture a new rules-based order rather than just uh, let a more anarchic order prevail. And China in some ways needs to play the same game. It needs to lay its cards on the table, make clear that it expects to have more influence commensurate with its greater power, but do things to convince others that it does not have predatory intent, that it does not have the intent to use its military forces in a predatory way. And that kind of mutual transparency and accommodation, I think, is key to avoiding that unintended slide toward geopolitical competition. Uh, and, and perhaps, uh, Charlie, as a way to, to uh, end our conversation, tell us a bit about the issues on, on which you are, you are currently doing research. Uh, uh, I know that you are currently finishing a book on, on, on Asia and the rest of the world. I mean, what is the book about? Well, uh, the book is, is very close to being finished. In fact, I hope to send it off today or tomorrow. And uh, the working title is No One's World. The Mm -hmm. West, the rise of the rest, and the coming global turn. And as the title indicates, I believe that the the next world will belong to no one. Mm -hmm. It will not be the American century, the Western century, the Chinese century, the Asian century. We're heading toward a world in which there will be multiple models and multiple powers with different views of how to organize life domestically and internationally, all out there competing in the marketplace of ideas. And this is going to be, I think, the first time in in history that we will live in a world that is integrated, that is globalized, but without a center of gravity. 
because the, the world more, really, really became the, integrated in the in the nineteenth century, but it was integrated under the guardianship of Europe and the United States. Now we are moving to a world that's integrated, but without that center of gravity. So the world uh, will belong to no one, but I guess the key question that you're trying to address and answer in the book is how do we make sure that we belong to this world and that we yes. all belong to this world? And how can we define no one's world and mm -hmm. infuse no one's world with a set of foundational principles about legitimacy, mm -hmm. about sovereignty, about commerce, about war and peace, about human rights, about international law, how can we infuse no one's world with those principles in a way that widens the circle, in a way that is inclusive, not exclusive, and enables this more pluralist world to function in an orderly and in a peaceful way? But it's a, it's a bit of a tricky business because clearly all these notions so far, uh, that is to say in the, past five, in the past five centuries, have been really you know, notions coming from the Western world. So, how, you know, do we have to redefine them or is there a way for, 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 for these notions to be embraced by uh, non-Western powers? I mean, uh, w w what's your analysis of this? Well, I think the common view in the United States, in Washington, people like John Eikenberry, my friend and colleague, is that the Western order is on the cusp of being universalized. And mm -hmm. even if the West loses its primacy, its principles will nonetheless be the principles for the future. I don't believe that that's the way the world will work. I think that when rising powers rise, they want to reshape the world and recast the world in ways that advantage their interests and that are consistent with their own political cultures and their own societies. And so I think that the Western world will continue to be just that, the Western world. And there will be a Washington consensus, but there will be a Brussels consensus, a Beijing consensus, a Delhi consensus, a Brasilia consensus, a Jakarta consensus. And there will be no dominant model in the way that there has been for the last 200 years. But Charlie, then the question is, how do you reconcile this model? This model how do you manage to have these models coming together? Because otherwise you have a multipolar, multipolarity, but not three things coming together. Well, you, you get lots of different players in the room, and you get Mr. Jean-Marc Quaco at the UN to host a video conference mm -hmm. of all these different players, and you begin a conversation. Mm -hmm. What are the rules of the next road? And you get the input from the Chinese and the South Africans and the Brazilians and other key players, and you attempt to forge a consensus. Because the idea that we're going to have the Chinese at this chair and then the Brazilians and the Indians and others in this room. And we're going to say to them, here, this is the Magna Carta. This is the American Constitution. This is the Lisbon Treaty. These founding Western documents, S please sign them. Yes. They're not going to sign them. It's not going to happen. Right? It's no. not going to happen. Yeah. Right? And so the only alternative is to sort of say, okay, let's put our cards on the table. Let's have a discussion about the founding rules for the world that is going to come next. So it's, it's a, it has to be a totally new world in a way. I think it has to be. That doesn't mean that important parts of the Western world will not survive, will not be part of the, of the rules of the next order. I think they will, but the West may well have to give as much as it gets as it seeks to fashion that new consensus. And you, 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 you believe that it will, it will have to happen? I believe that the effort must be made. Mm -hmm. Whether it is successful re remains to be seen. And it's going to be taking a long time? I mean, you, you, this process of, uh, of uh, alteration of the principles uh, which are now ruling the world, I mean, it's going to take 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? I mean, uh, what's your uh, timeline? Well, I don't think we have an enormous amount of time. And that's because by 2030, China will be the largest economy in the world. By your 2050, of the top leading powers in the world, only one of them will be from the West, the United States. The, all, all the others, when the top five, 
will be from what is today the developing world. Mm -hmm. And so we actually have to have that conversation sooner rather than later because the world is changing at a very quick pace.